Greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. Aloha. This is Bear Wozniak. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. And today we're going to talk about the fact that Satan has already been defeated and uh, give glory to Jesus Christ. We're going to have a wonderful conversation with um, exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, Father Vincent Lampert. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wasink Adventure. I can't think of a subject that's more important uh, right now uh, than this conversation we're going to be having with Father Vincent Lampert. He wrote the book Exorcism, The Battle Against Satan and His Demons. We know that you, we look at the world today and there just seems to be this, everyone talks about it. A coffee shop, other Christians, I don't know, they're saying, is this the end times? I mean, things are getting so, uh, the, the darkness seems to be getting darker. Um, and, and there's more and more division, and people get so caught up in kind of like the politics of everything, and they neglect to understand that our real battle is in the heavenly places against principalities and the powers of the air. And the good news is about, about being a Christian is that we love Jesus, and we know that he is King and King of Lord of Lords, and we know that Satan hates authority. He's the original rebel, the rebel without a clue. And his demons as well uh, live under, in rebellion, and they hate authority. That's why, as Catholics, it gives us such great uh, sense of strength and power and confidence, because this is the church that God established. This is the, the, the apostolic succession exists within the Catholic Church. And so when we're in right relationship with the church and the, the teachings of the church and the authorities, the bishops and, and, our, and our pastor and the church, there's great protection there. And, uh, and also a great victory over any of the, any demonic attacks. And so we thought this would be a, a, a real important conversation to have with Va Father Vincent Lampert. I know personally um, that I, I, I know probably most of us can say to some degree or another, we've sensed the work of the enemy uh, in our lives or others' lives, and we want to have more clarity about it. Father Vincent Lampert, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bear. It's good to be with you today and to, as you said, talk about this very important topic. But again, what we want to do is not to glorify the devil. We want to glorify God and celebrate the victory that he's already won. Yeah, because one of the things Satan tries to do is get attention. You know, I, he, he oftentimes tried to hide, too, but he eventually his goal is to for him to receive the glory that's only due to God. Yes, you're right. He wants to stand, you know, in the place of God, and he does that whenever he's able to advance his kingdom, when people give in to the world of darkness rather than celebrating the light of Christ that's around us. So if there's a greater presence of evil in the world today, my response would be it's because people are espousing what the devil is doing and giving him attention, putting him in the center which is a place that only should be reserved for Christ. He should be the center of our lives. Well, I want to I want to kind of bring this up at a very personal level because a lot of people know that I was uh, uh, raised Catholic, and then for a period of time I left the church for probably about ten to twelve years, and uh, that I had a tr tremendous experience of the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. But I had been under catechized, and I didn't have direction in my life to say, "Here's where you can go deeper." And because of the, the, the catechism of the Catholic Church, which lays down the teaching of the church with such clarity, and then understanding the early church fathers, I came roaring back to the faith. But there was a time when I was uh, living in non-denominational land, which is a beautiful place, a lot of great Christians and, and people who love the Lord and love the Word of God. So while I was uh, in the non-denominational non world, I served as, a, uh, I guess, the director of the college-age students in this, uh, in this 
non-denominational church, and we had only three or four members, and then it became this beautiful evangelistic uh, outreach that happened, and we had we went from that size to 40, and then up to 60 members. But it happened, Father, because there was a young man there who was a drummer, and he had this beautiful conversion experience, and then he brought his other musicians, and I guess you would call their the people that followed the band uh, would come, and uh, at one point, and they would want to say, "I want whatever he, whatever happened to him, I want that." And uh, and I found out though that they had been giving their lives to a, what they called an oversoul, a demonic presence, to help them with their music. Uh, and so when I would lead, I led one young man to the uh, to uh, the prayer of salvation, as they would call it. And as we did that, a demon manifested. It began to choke him. And so I went through that prayer of deliverance, you know, binding the spirit and finding out kind of what was going on. And several smaller demons were, were driven out. And then finally, this this the worst one. And it came out with kind of that roar. And then this man had just had experienced beautiful peace. And and uh, we prayed for him and fill and and. and uh, Ask the Lord to really fill him, and then th- those people begin to bring others to us, and there was this great evangelistic outreach. But I was definitely in over my head, and uh, I didn't, you know, I was, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I think that sense of smell, the gift of discernment, I knew that it wasn't up to me, it was up to the Lord and, and, and the Word of God, and, and there was a really beautiful deliverance. But now he- I here I am as a Catholic, and I want to understand as a lay person. What would I do if that situation happened again? And, 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 and what is our role as laity? And how do we um, participate in, in, in understanding the church's protocol? So that's what I'd like to do today. And I'd like to start out today by just saying, who is Satan? Who is Satan? That's a great question. Satan is a... We go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We look at the words of Scripture. Um Lucifer was probably the greatest of all of God's created beings in the angelic choir. He rebelled against God. We look at the book of Revelation. It says that his tail swept one third of the stars out of the sky. That's a reference to the fall of the angels. So when Lucifer chose to rebel against God, we could say that his choice reverberated through the entire angelic choir. And then one third of the angels chose to follow him in his rebellion against God. And so then Lucifer became Satan, the devil, and those fallen angels became his demons. He's no longer Lucifer. He's he's Satan. His name is not no longer. Cause it, what does the word Lucifer mean? I forget. The word Lucifer means uh, the bearer of light. We think of the word loose. It means light. What's, you know, the thing about Lucifer, he was the highest of the seraphim angels, meaning he was closest to the throne of God, the glory of God, so he would radiate the glory of God more than any of God's creatures. Wasn't it Michael the archangel that battled with him? Yes, because the name Michael means who is like God, so he's the one, when Lucifer was rebelling rebelling against God, he was the one that stepped in like, who is like God? Meaning, how <laughs> dare you, how dare you? <laughs> try to compare yourself and take the place of God? And Michael, uh, in the in the nine choirs of angels, he would be the second rung from the bottom, right? He's an archangel, but so God used Michael the archangel to kick his butt, right? Kick the kick him out. It's and of course we look exactly. at the beautiful the beautiful Virgin Mother, you know, who too by her caveat, you know, um, this little maiden, you know, uh, and so when Satan when Satan fell or rebelled, he didn't fall, he rebelled, and then he. And he and he and then Jesus said that he is the father of lies. And within him, without being tempted by anyone or anything, he said, "I'm going to rebel." And a third of the angels, Aquinas said that when the angels when the angels made a decision like that, that that's a permanent thing. They can't repent, or nor would they want to. Probably, can can Satan and the and the demons be saved? And the answer is no. And it's based on their angelic nature. So when God created angels we could say that they received infused knowledge. They were already in the presence of all that they could know. Certainly they don't know the future, but they could see every possible consequence of their actions. So even when before the rebellion against God, Lucifer could, Lucifer could see the fact that eternal damnation would be his fate. And yet even with that knowledge, he chose to rebel against God anyway. And so, the human person, we're capable of conversion. 
we can grow in our love and understanding of God, but for uh, angelic creatures, good and fallen, that would not be the case. You can, a good them. example might be, you know, metal, when it's heated up, you can mold it and shape it into whatever you want. But then once it's cooled down, it's solidified and it is what it is. Hmm. And so for angels that, that rebelled against God, they are now what they are. Someone even asked me recently, is it still possible for angels to rebel against God? And the answer would be no. The judgment at the angelic world has taken place already. Mm-hmm. Satan would know that the human person, which is God's greatest creation, because the human person is created in the image and likeness of God, we still have the possibility of eternal life. He wants us to reject God the same way that he has. They could say that misery loves company, mm-hmm. which is why then Satan and his demons afflict human persons. They would want us to rebel against God as well. We're talking with Father Vincent Lampert. Uh, he's an author. He's a, the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, and his new book is Exorcism, The Battle Against Satan and His Demons. We'll be right back to hear about uh, Christ's great victory. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Now you can journey with other men on the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue through Bear's Man Cave community in our three-year school of manliness. Join at deepadventure.com. Better yet, you can lead your own sons through the same compelling video, audio, and written content. Can you imagine how much deeper your relationship with your dad could have been and how much more you could have learned and pitfalls you might have avoided if your dad had a tool like this to help to draw you both into a deeper, life-changing discussion. Now you have a trigger that you can pull that will take you into gritty discussions with other men and with your sons at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak adventure. You know, in Hawaii, we say aloha, which means to give breath. Uh, and one of the most powerful instruments in deliverance is when the, when the priest, under the authority of the Catholic Church, breathes over the person who is, who, uh, who is seeking uh, deliverance from demonic oppression. And we just, just by the breath of God, or as Jesus says, the finger of God, if I deliver you by the finger of God, you know, God is all-powerful. Satan is not like the kind of opposite of God. He's just a created being, and uh, God is all-powerful. And, and and if you any of you here are suffering from some sort of uh, you, you know demonic oppression, uh, listen. We're going to be talking with Father about uh, understanding more the the spiritual battle and how uh, we are victorious in that. Uh, Father Father Vincent Lampert, the author of Exorcism: The Battle Against Satan and His Demons. Um, Father, there's we talked about how Lucifer rebelled, and the and and a third of the angels rebelled with him. That's what a demon is, a rebellious uh, being. Um, 
there are uh, you say, uh, Thomas Aquinas, and in your book, you talk about the difference between morning knowledge and evening knowledge. And I thought that's very interesting. I have a lot of friends who, not a lot, but several who do have done Ouija boards or go actually to psychics or Catholics and they go to psychics or they, uh, they uh, dabble in astrology and things like that. And sometimes what they get there comes out to be true. Uh, but it's 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 based on a, it's based on a lie. It's based on uh, the demon having some limited knowledge and and then perhaps saying this is going to happen. And then demonic influence even going around and and trying to make that happen. Uh, it's totally different with uh, with going to the Lord to discern and to know God's will for your life. What is the difference? What is is it? An Aquinas has said in your book that's the difference between morning knowledge and evening knowledge. I think it was so erudite. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so when God created the angelic world, Aquinas said that he gave them uh, evening knowledge, which is the knowledge of things in the natural order. That's why one of the signs of demonic possession is that when a demon manifests, it could speak a language otherwise unknown to the individual. So the demon doesn't have to go and study another language. It can just call it up, if you will. But when God gave the angels evening knowledge he then gave them a choice using their free will will they now accept things according to god's plan god's will for them and then we could say that that is uh the morning knowledge so evening knowledge is knowledge of things in the natural order morning knowledge is things according to god's will if you think about the story of creation you know evening came and morning followed and then it was the new day So the angelic world only became perfected when they took the evening knowledge, again, the knowledge of things in the natural order, and then united their wills to God in the supernatural order, you could say, and then they became perfected creatures. Those who rejected God's will, so Lucifer, and we would say his demons are now imperfect creatures. And then you look at uh, mankind, which is this incredible being, the great, the highest uh, creation of God, because we, God loves the material world he created, and although God is spirit, and in us is united this, the, 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 the clay and the, and the spirit, uh, our spiritual uh, soul, which is able to be united with God. We have this, we have this heaven and earth combined in a human being. Uh, but it isn't it interesting that in Genesis, God would come and speak to them in the cool of the day, in the evening, in the dusk. And so mankind at that time had some knowledge, uh, but not full morning knowledge, would you say? Or where, where were they uh, in the time of original innocence? I would say they were at that place where they're now taking the, grit, the gift of life that God had given him, his breath, if you will, because, mm-hmm. you know, breath is synonymous with life. Again, you talked about and you think of Jesus breathing on his disciples, giving them the Holy Spirit. Mm. Part of the ritual of exorcism is breathing on the face of the person who's manifesting. Again, invoking the Holy Spirit, because wherever the Holy Spirit is present, an unclean spirit cannot remain. Mm. So there in the Genesis account of creation, we could say that the human person was living in complete harmony with God in his creation. But then... The interesting thing, and you alluded to this earlier, Bear, you know, Lucifer's sin originated from within himself. It was his own. But for humanity, it wasn't something interior, it was exterior. So when we think about the human person, again, there's that great sense of harmony with God, but then the serpent in the garden kind of poised the question about rebellion. Again, we think of the serpent presenting, you know, the forbidden fruit, saying to Eve, surely you will not die, you will become like God. In other words, you don't need God, you can take that place yourself. Again, that's what Lucifer wanted to do, and then his rebellion, and then he was trying to get humanity to do the exact same thing. So prior to the fall, prior to original sin, the human person lived in perfect harmony with God. And we see that today, don't we, Father? We see that t- that today um, in the world. Uh, the biggest the biggest uh, problem with the world today is everybody sees themselves as having their own, as being their own God. 
Yeah, I, I say that people live by three guiding principles today, or at least a lot of them do. You may do whatever you wish. Nobody has the right to command you, and you're the God of yourself. So in that sense, we want free reign to do whatever we want. We don't want any limitations, no restrictions. And then again, we want to take the place of God. It was St. John Paul II uh, who talked about freedom doesn't mean that we get to do whatever we want to do. That freedom in the true sense of the word means to be obedient to God. So when we are obedient to God who created us, that's freedom in the true sense of the word. When we start believing that freedom means we can do whatever we want, then we end up becoming slaves to our own passions and desires. And we can even look back at Adam and Eve. When were they truly free? And that the answer is when they were obedient to God and lived according to his plan. But when they chose to rebel against God is when the bottom fell out. Yeah, uh, freedom, uh, that sort of freedom isn't liberty at all. Eventually you become bound up. People say, I remember once someone came up to me and said, introduce me to his wife. This is Bear. He's that guy I told you about. He really follows his passions. And I said, no, I don't. He goes, yeah, you're that guy. You do all this stuff. You jump on airplanes. You do all this kind of you really follow your passions? And I go, no, no I don't. And, and then he, a third time he said that to me, and I said, no. My, what, I, what I want to do is delight myself in the Lord and abandon myself to God's will. And in that, there's a lot of liberty. So he sees there's a difference between passion and desire. Desire is that upward. The word desire, I think, means look to the sky. And I have a desire to know the Lord and to serve God. And you may see me having these different adventures, but... It's not that I'm following my passions. I'm not being compelled or propelled or driven by passion. I'm being drawn and led by the Holy Spirit. Um, you, you, um, I think it'd be good to kind of take a little, begin, we're, we're going to have to take two segments to do this. But here's an interesting thing in your book that I really liked. Because I remember in being involved in a deliverance situation, and we weren't going to get it done that day. And we just bound... You know, and I'm not saying that laity should do this because now I know a better way, but we were able to just bind the enemy and then go and have coffee, you know, and come back another day. And I think in the book you mentioned someone who had gone through a priest that had gone through a deliverance situation. Maybe it was you, I forget. And they said, well, what did you do after that when the demon was screaming and yelling? What did you do after that? And you said something like, go to Dairy Queen. That, that was me. That was <laughs> after working with somebody for over a year. And once the demon was cast out, somebody asked me, well, what did you do afterwards? You know, as a priest, did you go celebrate Mass? Did you pray the rosary? Did you, you know, what did you do? I said, I went to Dairy Queen and had a chocolate shake. <laughs> and you said, if the people, there was a long line, if they had known what you had just been through, they would have all left and said, yeah, you, do, you just do whatever you want. You can get to the front of the line. You get, you know, they would have been like, watch out. I've been, I would have been like Moses parting the Red Sea because they would have gotten out of the way if they knew where I had just come from. But the point of that is, you know, life goes on. The devil may try to present himself as something greater than he is, but he's already been defeated. You know, we, we can even say that in an exorcism, what the church does is throw into the face of the devil and his demons that which they have rejected. The very basic components of our Christian faith, which is a relationship with God. And so, you know, whether it's blessing the person with holy water, reminding us of baptism, showing the well, crucifix, you well, name it. I mean, I think, I think I think it's so cool about being Catholic is that Satan hates authority. You can bless someone with water and it won't have any effect on them. But when you bless them with holy water, which has been really represents the authority of the church and the anointing of the Lord... They shriek, you know, like and when you walk in my house, there's a crucifix above that door that's been blessed. And that's what gives it the power. It's just the whole authority that God gave the church. Whatever you bind on heaven will be bound on, or whatever you bound on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There's a great liberty and freedom uh, and power in just being Catholic. And, and, the, and we're going to get into that a little bit more when we get right back. We're talking with Father Vincent Lambert, Lampert. It's so cool because you're such a, how would I describe you when I've watched your YouTube videos? You're just very calm 
and reassuring. <laughs> here you're doing, here you're slaying dragons. Uh, we're talking with Father Vincent Lampert, the author of Exorcism, The Battle Against Satan and His Demons. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. We invite our mama bears to join with us at deepadventure.com. You'll have access to all of the Long Ride Home TV shows even before they air on EWTN. Plus, three years of the shareable Ocean Sunrise daily catechism videos. Plus, at deepadventure.com, a 20% discount at our online store with all of our great t-shirts and clothes and books and rosaries and medals and all kinds of accessories. You'll also get an autographed copy of Bear's latest book, and for a limited time, a Catholic biker stuffed teddy bear. All at deepadventure.com. Come on, Mama Bears, let's hear you roar. Did you know that each Saturday morning you can receive the shareable YouTube video version of the Bear Wozniak Adventure in our inspiring weekly newsletter, even before it airs on the radio or hits the podcast apps? Never miss another episode. You can even binge watch Bear's inspiring guests. Think about the impact you can have sharing these videos with your friends. Go to deepadventure.com and click the subscribe button. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Big, big, big thing I need to tell you guys. Jesus loves you and has a great, beautiful, wonderful plan for your life. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God, God, is, God is in control. Don't be looking all the time at circumstances. The world today just seems so kind of scary to people. Just know that Jesus, uh, Jesus is the champion. Jesus, Jesus defeated Satan at the cross, and he used Satan's weapon, right? The, what, what is Satan's weapon was death. And as a, as a ninja black belt, I love to train in, in, in knife fighting. And I just remember at the cross, you know, when one of the things you do about knife fighting is, or in any fight is you stage the fight. You kind of like, I'm going to, I'm going to give this person a target. You know, maybe I'll open up my neck or maybe I'll open up my, my, my stomach for the attack to come. But the good news about being in a knife fight is you know where the attack's going to come from, probably the knife. And you know that uh, you can kind of stage it, give him a target. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He said, come at me, bro, you know, and he, he staged that, that cross. And when Satan came, one of the funniest things to do is when someone attacks you with a knife is to slay them with their own knife. It cracks me up. It's just kind of a technical sort of thing. And, of course, we're just using training weapons. But Jesus did that. He defeated Satan at the cross. Satan came at him with, uh, with the temptations in the desert. And, and the, final, the final round, in the final round, he attacked him with, the, with, the, with, um, with death. And Jesus defeated him. He's the champion. And we're talking with Father Vincent Lampert, who couldn't be more perfect uh, a choice, I think, in a sense, as a, as a, as the exorcist for the diocese of Indianapolis, because he's so calm and like nothing, nothing to see here, and yet he 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 wields the weapon of the Holy Spirit, uh, and we- weapon of the Lord in his book, the battle against Satan and his demons. Father, there's different ways that demons. Uh, uh, there's different types of demonic activity, and again, we want to tell people. We're gonna. I'm gonna ask you to share with me what those are. But again, we're not here to focus on Satan. He's a punk. We're here to focus on the champion, Jesus Christ. Uh, but can you talk to us a little bit about uh, what are the different areas that the enemy, you know, can try to make an impact? Yep. And before commenting on that, I would say just to pick up on what you've been saying. You know, in an exorcism, Jesus is not the bystander. He's the main actor, and that's why we need to rely on him. The Church does recognize four different types of extraordinary demonic activity, so ways that the devil really tries to uh, afflict humans. Number one would be demonic infestation, the presence of evil in a location or associated with an object. We can think of demonic uh, vexation, which are physical attacks. Somebody might be getting marks on their bodies, bruises or bites or scrapes, 
incisions of letters that appear on the body for a period of time and then subside. There's demonic obsession, which are mental attacks. So a person is experiencing, no matter what they do, everything they are thinking is filtered through the presence of evil. And then we have demonic obsession, whereby the devil or one of his demons may control the person's body, treating that body as if it were its own. You know, when it comes to demonic possession, you know, we think of why would the devil want to possess a human body? And the answer we would say is the incarnation. The greatest thing that God did for us was to take on human form, the person of Jesus Christ, the devil, his demons believe that they take on human form when they possess a human body. So let's kind of backtrack and start again and, and go a little bit deeper into each of those areas. Uh, infestation is where a demon will take, uh, there'll be demonic activity in a certain object or a certain location. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes, d d just develop that thought for us, will you? Yeah, so you think of a, a house that's haunted or somebody believes that strange occurrences are taking place in a location. You know, people might be hearing noises, might be seeing figures of shadows and that type of thing. You know, the thing again about, we go back to some of the fathers of the church, you know, as pure spirits, we would say, that a demon is neither here nor there. We say it's here or there if it's choosing to act there. So mm -hmm. if there's demonic activity in a location, we would want to ask the question, why is that taking place? Because spirits don't have an address. It's not like they live in that location. So why are they acting there? Did some horrific crime take place there? Was somebody involved in some type of uh, occult activity, such as a seance, trying to communicate with so did somebody do violated the laws of God that created an entry point for the demonic in that location? Objects, we think of things like maybe a voodoo doll. Again, things that are inherently evil in nature. Ouija board. Again, anything that's going to create an entry point in, for uh, evil into people's lives. We're going to talk more about that area, about entry points and, and how to protect ourselves from that. But I can tell you there's an island here in the islands, uh, which I love and treasure. Uh, and yet there's a certain part of that island that when I went over there, I thought, oh, there's something, something bad over here. Could just It's like a, a discernment is like being able to smell a rat. And there was just kind of that heavy, there's something wrong here. And I talked to a friend of mine who was an associate pastor at one of the churches on this small island. And he said, yeah, bro, you don't go over there without your pastor because that's where they practice human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So because of something like that, um, um, you know, there can be a demonic presence. I imagine you would feel that presence perhaps in abortion mills and things like that too but yeah so there are certain places that that you may you may sense that but then you have like i love this you know i'm a i love athanasius saint athanasius i just dig on him so much and he's the one that wrote that book about saint anthony of the desert and they went out there to do battle and saint anthony would actually physically have to fight i mean he he was he would be pummeled in, in his wrestling with god so it isn't uh it, it it is not just um um the, the 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 attack a physical attack can be because of allowing somehow in our lives where we've allowed that but we, but there are there are saints who have wrestled with with the enemy too yes and there i would call that demonic oppression mm. so oppression and vexation are both physical attacks vexation would mean that somebody did something to violate god's law if you will mm -hmm. that brought that about to me, demonic oppression is a gift from God. God allows one to be afflicted by the evil one as an opportunity for that person to show their fidelity to God. Many great examples. Mm. We think of Job out of the Old Testament. We think of St. Paul. He speaks of the thorn in the, in the flesh he received, a messenger from Satan sent to torment him to keep him from becoming proud. We think of some of the great saints of the church, St. Catherine of Siena, St. John Vianney, St. Padre Pio. Nobody would have suggested that any of these holy men or women needed an exorcism. But again, they were being afflicted by the evil one as an opportunity to grow in holiness and virtue. Mm. 
Beautiful. And then we have this kind of gnarlier situation, uh, and that would be the the possession where there's it, when so what, what does that mean when someone has has define that for us the Catholic Church's definition of that. So demonic possession would be whereby Satan or one of his demons would take control of a person's body, treating that person's body as if it were its own. So using the person's eyes to see, their mouth to speak, their hands to give gestures, their legs and feet to walk. Again, we could say that the demon is taking on human form. In cases that I've dealt with, when the demon takes over a person's body, some people will be aware of what's taking place. They say that they're it's like being trapped in their body, but they're powerless to stop it. Other people have no recollection of what was taking place. You know, what's interesting when you think about possession, oftentimes people will say that the fall of Lucifer, his rebellion was on pride. But even some of the fathers of the church would take it a step further and would say that it was the rejection of the incarnation that Lucifer, who was the greatest of all of God's creatures, couldn't accept the fact that human flesh would be elevated higher than himself. Again, we think of Jesus taking on human form, the incarnation. We look at our Blessed Mother becoming Queen of Heaven. And he just could not accept the fact that somehow he was going to be knocked down a rung, if you will. And that's what's so cool. I mean, like, angels aren't jealous that there's angels. We, we call it a hierarchy, right? That they're not jealous of. They're they're very happy and fulfilled in the place in the place that they are. You know, one of the cool books that I read. It was a heavy book. I was 19 when I read it. C.S. Lewis's book, Screw Tape Letters. It's, I, I highly recommend that book. It kind of does give you a little peek behind the veil to see the mentality. You know, it, it, God God leads us. God is, Jesus is a shepherd. He draws us to him. Satan is an oppressor. He's a bully. And in the demonic world, speaking in this realm of, of, of possession, um, there's kind of, in the screw tape letters, there's a, there's a younger demon that's being, or a lower demon being coached and being mentored by an, old, uh, an older demon. And, he's, and he kind of kind of bullies this younger demon. And you see that when you're in a deliverance situation, there seems to be more of a, a kind of one demon that's very strong and then there's the ones that are underneath him and quite often he kind of kicks those little ones out first to make you think that you got them talk can you talk about in in the realm of that area in that area do you see that do you see that type of it's usually not just one demon there's usually kind of like a little nest of them there is yes there's like a cluster of them mm. you know when we read the gospel accounts of jesus uh performing exorcisms Oftentimes, when the demons speak, if you pay close attention, they always go from the singular to the plural. Mm. You know, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. What do you have to do with us, Jesus mm. of Nazareth? We're going to be. But we're going to take a break. That. We're going to take a break, Father. We'll be right back. I got carried away, but we'll talk about this. These the different clusters that can be manifested. And uh, remember, you everybody, we're talking about Jesus Christ, King of King and Lord of Lords. That's who we serve. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different tally awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link, or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. 
When you go to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel, you get access to all of our free playlists, including hundreds of episodes of the Bear Wozniak Adventure, plus the three-year journey through the whole catechism in our Ocean Sunrise Catechism series. And you even get short clips and live streaming of Bear and Cindy's Adventures in Paradise videos. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure channel. still listening i thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station while well, you asked for it here is more of the bear wasnick adventure who have high in heaven but thee, O god and there's none on this earth i desire beside thee my flesh and my heart failed but you are the strength of my life and my inheritance forever we're talking with father vincent lampert he's the exorcist for the archdiocese of indianapolis really recommend reading his book i think every catholic should understand this area of battle exorcism the battle against satan and his demons so we're talking about when someone's in, in experiencing possession there may be uh, a clusters a cluster or different clusters under different hierarchy different areas um I, I want to talk about that, and then maybe we can get to the point where we talk about how how does this happen? How does someone find themselves in this situation? If we don't get this all done, we'll do it in a second interview uh, later on. But can you tell me more about in that deliverance situation? What is it that you you mean by when you say you want to, you'll encounter a cluster of demons? So when somebody's possessed, usually it's not a case of one demon, but of multiple demons. And usually there's a higher ranking demon. So when the angels fell, they fell from all different nine choirs. Mm. So just as much as we say there's a hierarchy in the angelic world, there is a hierarchy within the demonic world. And we shouldn't think that it's some type of a fraternity. There's no collegiality amongst <laughs> the demons. They hate each other just as much as they hate us. But oftentimes when somebody is possessed, Again, within the cluster, there's a higher ranking demon. And the, the demons from a lower ranking are always the first to be cast out, if you will. It's almost like they cannot resist the power and the authority. The resistance isn't that great. But one that's of a higher ranking does tend to be more persistent. So I did an exorcism one time where seven demons named themselves in this particular person. Six of the demons were quick to go. But the one demon, so the more dominant demon, told me it did not have to leave because it had been invited in. And it identified itself as the demon Leviathan. Mm. Again, a demon mentioned within the Bible. And the demon told me it did not have to leave because it had been invited in. And we've been discussing how demons are very authoritative. They respect authority. And so this one said that it had been invited in so it was using that authority to claim the life of this person as 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 its own. But there's a, there is this holy of holies within us, this sacred part of us of our of our will and our intellect that you talk about in your in your book, where that, that there is that element within that person who maybe did invite him in, but he has the free choice now to tell him to leave too by by his faith in in Jesus Christ. So because someone did that once, as they did in the case of these musicians I talked about, it doesn't mean... You know, I, I've noticed father in situations that's almost like a cattle prod. When, you, when something happens and you say the name of Jesus Christ and you, and you command them in the name of Jesus, it's like, ouch! You know, there's like this manifestation. But I, I think it's almost like the bigger, more hierarchical demon kind of says, you go. I'm pushing you out so they didn't think that I'm gone. But isn't it amazing the power of, of, of the name of Jesus Christ in a situation like that? It's not like you can't, it's not like it happens right away, right? Sometimes it happens in 30 minutes or an hour, but then sometimes it, it, you said like in one case there was a whole year of, of mm -hmm. returning and returning and, and, and battling and dealing. Uh, why does it take so long sometimes? What is the... What is the um, um, why, you know, Jesus said there's some that only come up by fasting and praying when is you know, mm -hmm. it's a battle. I would say fortitude. God always determines the, the timing. So God always does things according to his 
greater purpose that perhaps we don't yet fully understand. But it goes back to, again, that Jesus is the true exorcist, you know. He's not the bystander. He is the main actor, and he's acting through his ministers. And so God will determine the point of uh, complete liberation for the individual. But even with that said, every time somebody is prayed for or prayed over, it does bring some benefit and relief, even if at that moment it doesn't bring total liberation. But again, God is always in charge and things are being played out according to his greater purposes that we may not fully understand. Well, you had mentioned to us that we can come back and have a second time with you, which I think we really want to do because we don't want it. Just like we said, it can take longer maybe in the process, too. And we still have some more time, but I don't want to feel rushed to cover this this in, this important you know topic. But I, I, So I'd like to take a little lift off some of this area for a moment, and I'd like for you to talk to parents uh, about their authority. You know, this is the year— of, of, of St. Joseph, the terror of demons. <laughs> How do parents take authority in their own household? Uh, you know, blessing their home, or what do we do as far as just uh, the, the avenues uh, of, of access that the enemy has through iPhones or through... Uh, what, what, what would you advise parents now in form of... Because, uh, because Satan, you, as, as a parent, and especially as a father, you have an authority... Uh, over the enemy. And Joseph, terror of demons, the, the father of Jesus, the earthly father of Jesus. Can you talk to parents uh, and, and, and men in particular? And I, w- and I would begin by saying, you know, if a priest takes his priesthood seriously, so will the devil. Now let's take that a step further. If a father takes his role within the family seriously, so will the devil. You know, I think there's a danger today where maybe many parents, including fathers, rather than wanting to be that source of authority within the home, oftentimes maybe just want to be their child's friend. And again, it's important for parents to have good relationship, relationships with their children. But again, that sense of authority is so important. So men need to be grounded in their faith. They need to have their own relationship with Jesus Christ. They need to be in love with him. And they need to share that within their families. And then if fathers are doing that, you know, by watching, you know, what programs are our children watching on TV? What types, what are they doing with all their, you know, uh, IT gadgets what's coming into the home? You look at the world in which we live today. I mean, pornography is a great scourge on society today. And it's coming into homes through a lot of technology that children are looking at. So fathers could take control by making sure that they know what their children are watching, what they're looking at, what types of books that they're reading. You know, there's a lot of literature today that uh, glamorizes evil, and the danger is that it creates a fascination with the devil. Yeah, the whole wizard and witches type books that are just like the most popular books there are for young children and, and for even adults. Uh, what about... You what, know, the thing... Mm-hmm. You know, School, I think one of the one of the biggest things is what are they learning in school is so opposite of the teaching of God that many parents are having to make the decision that we're going to homeschool or we're going to make the sacrifice and make sure our children get to a good uh, you know Christian school, Catholic school, uh, because what they what they're learning in the home is undermined by two things: the the, the brainwashing at school and the and the peer pressure they get from their friends. Yeah, I think faith. Is really looked down upon. If you're a person of faith today, people almost laugh at you. Or if you still believe in God, people kind of look down upon but you. But they're quicker to believe in Satan, aren't they? They, be, they mean like, but wizards and demons and all that stuff. Oh yeah, but but God, no. I think there's an old song out there somewhere that goes, "I know there ain't no heaven, but I pray there ain't no hell." Yeah, right. <laughs> there is that fascination that people have with the devil, and I tell people even in the world of exorcism. My focus is not on what the devil is doing. My focus is always on, you know, the power of God and what he wants to do in our lives and trying to help people connect with him. So again, we look at the year of St. Joseph, a great fatherly figure, you know, one who, you know, used his authority in the right way. And I believe that if fathers do that today, 
then we can overcome anything that comes our way. You know, faith in God leads us in one direction. The lack of faith will lead us in another. If the devil is having the upper hand today, then I would say it's because we do not know our faith. You know, the interesting thing about children, they will expect their mothers to be spiritual, but when fathers choose to be spiritual, it speaks volumes to their children. And so if fathers are taking the priority to go to Mass, pray, to be men of God, then that's going to have a great impact on what role God will have in the lives of these children and what type of relationship that would be. If they wake up in the morning and they see their dad, like I have a prayer chair. That's the chair I, I, I read, pursue, to go deeper in my faith and where I have my morning prayer. That's, that's what that chair is for. And when pe- kids wake up in the morning and they see, oh, their dad's been praying, or the dad's saying, let's get ready for mass, which is always a nightmare for me. I had to take my kids. I'd throw them in the jacuzzi at the pool outside and bubble up the jacuzzi with shampoo and then my sons and then throw them into their clothes almost still wet and say, you, you know, I, it was so hard to hustle four kids to, to church, but you do it, you know. So we're talking with Father Vincent Lampert, and, and I know you said the main priority is to lift up Jesus Christ. And then second, I think you said was Dairy Queen. I'm not sure if I picked that up, but but to keep this all natural and, and comfortable and realize that God, Jesus is, is the exorcist. Jesus is in control. Father, can we invite you back to talk more about this, about how this type of thing kind of gets started in someone and, and more about the protocols in the church and how you take care of this situation if you see that this sort of thing happening? Yes, I'd absolutely would welcome the opportunity to come back you know, some exorcists are publicly known. Some chose choose to remain anonymous. I'm publicly known because I want to talk about the subject and to try to help educate folks on what the church actually believes about the reality of the devil. Because the more that we understand who the devil is, we come to realize he's nothing fair, most especially if our relationship with Christ is where it needs to be. If you have a concern like this in your life, um, I suggest you go speak to your priest. And then when we come back we'll, with Father Lamper um, in our ne- the next interview that we do, we'll talk more about this. If you want to find more out about our ministry, you can go to deepadventure.com. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. And Father, what we do here is we, we, say, uh, we end by saying, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. So, uh, and then we say aloha. So may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. (laughs) Thank you, Father. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell.